great. I know, right? You guys are so excited. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Stuff that is not serotonin. So we spent a whole <coughs> week talking about stuff that was serotonin, which Brooke is also known as serotonin. Also known as 5-HT, <coughs> right? So, looking for a new tattoo, 5-HT is a great one. I don't know, I, I, nobody. Katie, for some reason you don't think that's a good idea. Um, Dopamine would be cooler, I think. Put your into that. <laughs> Serotonin is never going to let you down, right? How many of you have a tattoo of uh, someone's name? Don't answer that. On your body. Uh, and that, that person has the potential to let you down. And then you have to get that edited. And there are only a few ways to do that. One of them is to like, lose your arm. Put it on your arm, though. Well, your lifestyle's just changed. Um, Got to keep that covered. So, yeah, I don't know. That's why names, right? Geometric shapes are okay. Like geometry won't let you down. Uh, neurotransmitters are also okay. They won't let you down. So these are things that are okay to get tattoos of. Right, Bree? Be cool if you did the whole synthesis pathway, right? Like, like going down your forearm. That'd be interesting. Have all the enzymes on there. All right, so we're going to talk about stuff that's not serotonin, despite the fact we spent a lot of time talking about serotonin. And based on that kind of story I gave you, you would, you probably spent the last week walking around thinking aggression is just serotonin, right? You either have it or you don't, and that's going to affect things. Well, let's talk about some other stuff here. <clears throat> hey, Brad, you want to talk about frustration? I know you do because you, you've mentioned this. Um, Frustration can lead to aggression, right? How many of you have ever been frustrated? Great. Uh, how many of you are frustrated right now? I need to know this. All right. So we've got one person to avoid. Um, when you are frustrated and when you've been frustrated, have you responded in a way that was um, aggressive? You get frustrated, you get irritable, you lash out at people. It happens. Uh, don't worry about it. I mean, it's, it's going to happen, right? I mean, so I don't worry about it. Uh, largely, I try to avoid getting frustrated. Uh, so that helps. Now, what are things that frustrate you? Kids and roses. What? <laughs> Kids and roses. No. <laughs> I really thought that's what she said. Kissing noises. Kissing noises. Irritating as fuck. <laughs> whistling. I hate whistling. Slow See, slow. other people slow drivers. have the same things. I'm going to try to drive slow and simultaneously go... <laughs> <laughs> and, and see people I can frustrate. That's... While fun. in the car with you, that would probably be horrible. Yeah. 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 And I think that people typically only ride with me once. Um, and not that any of you will ever be in a car with me. But I, my driving is um, it's actually great. Is it? It actually is. By your definition? No. Or? Just, just by the universe. It's actually quite good. Um, but but I, I have some tendency to like not always be paying attention, <laughs> or um, sometimes I use the other lane when nobody's in it. But if they're not using it, it's free, right? It's a free lane to use. I have those, like, I'm, I'm, I'm Daniel Craig, it's James Bond moments, and I get over in the other lane for a few minutes. You know British people drive on the other side of the road, right? Okay, just Chelsea throwing that out there. Um, so frustration, those are, I would, I would classify those as irritating. Right, more than I would frustrate. Although the slow driving, that, that might be related. Um, one of the things that is really frustrating to you and like every other species is um, when, when you're supposed to get something and you don't. Right, Brad? Have you ever had a late paycheck? Yeah, Montana's like, yeah. And what did you do? I called HR. <laughs> right, like instant. 
instantly, you're like, it's a minute late. <laughs> HR is hearing about this. Uh, that scheduled reinforcement, when you, when you miss that scheduled reinforcement, uh, that gets really frustrating, right? Okay. So uh, I'm thinking about things like child support payments. So, so you're supposed to, like, like if you are someone who receives child support payments, right? You're I supposed feel like you have no kids. I don't have any kids, so I, don't, I, I think about it. I don't do it. Oh, okay. I, don't, I don't make child support payments. I just think about them and, and how like, bad that is for everybody who has to make those. Uh, but how many of you know someone who in the past has received child support payments? You don't have to, you, you can't, I mean, it could be anybody, it could be your neighbor, right? That doesn't really, so you can kind of admit that. Uh, Brooke, did that person get frustrated if they were late? Because like everybody I've ever known <laughs> who is supposed to receive child support payments, if they're not early, they're upset. Um, and and that may, there may be some other context there. But scheduled reinforcement, if you miss that, you get frustrated. When you get frustrated, you get aggressive, right? Okay. What are some other things that, uh, how many of you ever get frustrated when you're trying to download or stream a movie? And it, it, right? Sched it's, it's, it's a scheduled reinforcement. I'm supposed to see what happens to Mr. Bean now. <laughs> <laughs> Not 30 seconds or 5 milliseconds Xfinity when you buffer. I have Xfinity, so how many of you guys have like Frontier? It's probably worse because I, I actually have really fast internet. I don't watch Xfinity. It is pretty. I pay a lot, but it's fast. So it's yeah, I pay a lot. Mine sucks. <laughs> You get upset about that? Yeah. Have you ever sent it? So I do this sometimes. I send them in a prorated bill if I try to get online and my internet's out. <laughs> so I'm that person. Um, <laughs> they, they keep telling me, it's like a dollar thirty. They think I owe them that they'll never get from me. Uh, and like every month I subtract a dollar thirty off the bill and I write them a note about every three months to remind them of why I'm doing that. <laughs> uh, which, as of <laughs> yet, they've not removed. They mark you as this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I am certain I'm on the list. I don't call in and yell at people. I mean, that's that's a waste of time. The guy on the phone has no ability to resolve that. I just write a little note. It makes me feel better, right? Because what does that do? Brad, that helps me alleviate that frustration. Right? Sorry, sorry, do that. Um, you know who else gets frustrated? Pigeons. How many of you, I, I know surprisingly, right? Uh, how many of you love pigeons? <coughs> How many of you love doves? Those are pigeons that got in some white paint. Uh, they're all kind of the, all kind of the same, right, Lauren? I mean, pigeons. As dumb as pigeons are, and, and they're, they're not so bright, they actually, I mean, some birds are, are, are pretty smart, but pigeons aren't in that group. They will get really frightened. I mean, and they're, most of the time, pigeons are not really aggressive, right? I mean, most of the time, I mean, like a pigeon, you can look at it and it runs away, right? It's not aggressive. They don't typically, you know, pigeons are not known as attack birds, right? So, so Katie, nobody's going to have like a pack of attack pigeons, right, to like guard their house. Uh, maybe you could try, I could see Skinner trying to like train pigeons, right, to, to guard his house. Nobody thought that was funny. You know, he, he trained pigeons to guide missiles. True story. Um, and then the government, the like U.S. government and the military were kind of like, yo, know, BF, we've got like laser guided stuff now. We don't need your pigeons. And he was like, oh. <laughs> I think that's how that went. But yeah, he actually did train pigeons to guide missiles. So pigeons will get really frustrated if they miss a scheduled reinforcement. And they will actually then attack other birds. Because you know it's that other bird's fault, right? Bree, have you ever done that? Like you've been frustrated about something and then you took it out on the wrong person. Right? Like someone who you know was not involved at all. Right? So this is not a problem solving approach, right? This type of aggression, this sort of frustration release is not in any way aimed at alleviating your immediate predicament, right? It is simply to, you know, blow off some steam. Right? You might be really frustrated because you didn't get that child support payment. Um, and guess who's going to hear about it? The mailman, right? Why, why your postal carrier? Well, it's not their fault. They just deliver what they receive, right? That's how it works, Meredith. Um, so there you go. So pigeons will get really upset if they don't get a scheduled reinforcement. Same as you, 
So you are no different than a pigeon in that regard. Actually, it is no man's fault when your neighbor brings you the check. Yeah, that's a little different story. Um, and, and maybe in that case, yelling at the postal carrier will, will be effective. Um, or then all of your mail will be laid right, the rest of your life. Uh, so you have to think about that too. You have to balance that out. So, pigeons, scheduled reinforcement, there you go. The other thing that will get you really frustrated, uh, so there's like, like social frustration, right? How many of you have ever had a squatter? <laughs> I think some of you took that the wrong way. Uh, I mean, right, Lauren? Because they laughed. It was not that great of a joke. And there was a lot of laughing, and I just don't... I don't think you got it to have laughed that much because I didn't really laugh that much and I told it. Uh, so eviction, right, attempts. So this maybe happens. This is frustrating. Like when you have someone living with you um, and you try to get them to leave. And they don't. Okay. Now, for most of us, so this is going to be like a weird situation, right? Uh, you, what would be really frustrating is if someone moved into your home and then, so I'm going to like imagine... So I know not everybody's in this situation, okay, Dina? And I don't know if you are or you're not, and so it doesn't matter. But let's assume that you all uh, live with someone with whom you are regularly mating, okay? So let's assume that is your life now, right? Uh, if that is your life, thumbs up. If it's not, thumbs up, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, work toward that or away from that as you so choose. I don't know that anybody would work away from that, right? I mean, that doesn't seem like something like people are going to actively like, you know, try to get away from. But, point is, what if someone, and now we're going to imagine this situation, there's a third person who moves into your home, and they try to, like, mate with the person you're mating with. That can be frustrating, right? So so you can imagine, Amanda, right? I mean, I see this being a frustrating situation, right? Like, if all of a sudden, like, some person moved into my house and started trying to mate with my wife, I would probably try to throw them out. That seems like a very normal response, right? But let's imagine that you can't throw them out. That's probably going to be really frustrating, right? They're not trying to mate with you, by the way, so that's the kicker here, right? Just the other person. It depends on what the other person is doing back. Yeah, but I still think you're going to try to get rid of them, right? Even if the other person... Well, you going to get rid of them. But you maybe get rid of both of them, right? <laughs> it's two for one. Um, still frustrating. And if they don't leave, you leave. If now let's imagine you're a, a mouse or a bird or a crayfish. Pick your favorite. Um, and we're going to put you in that same situation where you have a mate. Um, and then we're going to put another like sort of mate in there. But what we're going to do is, is we're going to put a screen between you. So that actual, like, um, like if, if it's like two males, that male's not going to be able to get to the female. But it's going to be there anyway. And you're going to think like, well, it's constantly trying to get to that female. Um, and you're like that male crayfish that was originally there, that's going to be really frustrating. You're going to try to get rid of that crayfish even though it's on the other side of the screen that you can't get rid of, right? So you're going to constantly be like going up and like clacking your claws on there, and doing your mural spread, and shooting urine out of your eyes. Please tell me that's a real thing because that's hilarious. <laughs> I uh, will not tell you if that's a real thing because you should have A, been in class, or B, watched the lecture. You'll have to go back and watch the crustaceans lecture. Find out if that's a real thing. Wait, was that on the first day? No. Because I feel like you said something about lobsters on the first day. I did talk about lobsters, but you should still subscribe. That'll make me 24 followers. You have 25. I have 25 now? You signed up twice? Well, no, somebody signed up since. Oh. So, you're going to really try to like get rid of that other crayfish or pigeon or rabbit, I don't know, you know, whatever whatever animal you want to be. So that's pretty typical. So these eviction attempts will get really frustrating as well. Um, and then you'll constantly be like rattling on the cage. So does that work? Pigeons, frustration, scheduled reinforcement. You guys know about scheduled reinforcement versus other kinds of reinforcement? Should we take a moment and, and describe that? What's like not scheduled reinforcement? It's like random stuff, right? Like you do something once in a while, something happens, but like if you get a paycheck every two weeks, then that's pretty well scheduled, right? Because every two weeks you're getting a paycheck. Okay. I 
think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a business started. And I'm going to randomly pay my employees. I'm going to pay them what they've earned, right? But I'm just going to dole it out at random times and in random amounts. Uh, so, so this paycheck, you know, I might pay you like for a while, like every day. And then one time I might decide, well, now I'm not going to pay you for three months, but I'm going to pay you three months worth at the end of that. Uh, and then see, see, Jessica, you think that's a good idea? That's not legal, is it? It's kind of how the government works whenever they shut down. They might have accomplished more in those three days they were shut down than they had in the last year they were open, so there's that. <laughs> One day something will happen. I mean, it's pretty <laughs> word of the word of wisdom there. All right. Questions about frustration. Questions about pigeons. No. You know, pigeon breeding um, in like the 1800s in England was like the thing to do. Like, like uh, they they created uh, through selective breeding like tumbling pigeons. Like these <coughs> pigeons would just like they were, they were clumsy. They were kind of like fall and then they would like start flying so they had like all of these designer pigeons <laughs> kind of like people have designer dogs now that's the business you just go like randomly find a dog you're like well this is a and they come up with a cute name and you can sell it for fifteen hundred dollars like i found that dog on the side of the road it's fifteen hundred dollar profit this is a business model I take note of this yeah. all right <clears throat> that sounds like something right you should know about pigeons, scheduled reinforcement, frustration, other things. Hey, uh, what about other monoamines? What was the original monoamine we talked about? Serotonin. Yeah, because we didn't spend very long on that, so, so I don't know if you guys caught that serotonin was important. I just wanted to kind of give a call back there to serotonin because it does not get enough credit um, in the world of aggression, right? Brooke, that's, that's a complete lie because we, we spent two and a half hours yeah. on serotonin. Here. You were there, yeah. It was brilliant, wasn't it? Yeah. It was the best lecture you've heard on serotonin this semester. I, probably because I'm the only person who give lecture, gives lectures about serotonin, and I, I know you haven't heard anything else from me about it. So that, that probably is the best. So what are the other monoamines? I didn't just make a list here. I'm going to talk about these. I just you want to know. Let's start with talking about norepinephrine. Who loves norepinephrine? Yeah, right? It's cool. Yeah. Okay, it does awesome things for you, right? Uh, like increases your heart rate. Yeah, how many of you love to have a heart rate? Okay, that's the um, So there you go. Because when you don't have a heart rate, well, yeah, there you go, right? Somebody took a biology class. <laughs> Norepinephrine is... <laughs> Dina, why weren't you ready with that? I know you're, you're like a biology person. You, just, you were thinking too far ahead. Uh, so norepinephrine, also known as noradrenaline. Why is it known as noradrenaline? It's also made by your uh, adrenal cortex, which I like to call the elf hat on your kidney. <laughs> You guys all have kidneys, right? And there's like this little hat on top of that. That's your adrenal gland. Uh, how many of you have ever had an adrenaline rush? It's like every Thursday at 4 o'clock. Uh, <laughs> took some of you a few moments to realize this class is every Thursday at 4 o'clock. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so that adrenaline rush, norepinephrine, it is part of the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. It's going to activate that division, right? So that's going to be things that get you sort of up and moving and doing, right? So it's going to uh, have some influence on things like glucose metabolism. It's going to affect some other things, right? It's going to have all kinds of hormones floating around, fun stuff like that. It seems as though norepinephrine plays a role in aggressive behavior. It doesn't necessarily um, initiate aggressive behavior, right? So norepinephrine in and of itself is not going to cause you to be aggressive necessarily, right? 
How many of you have ever had a situation where you think you had a lot of norepinephrine uh, flowing and you weren't aggressive? This would be a time like you ran from someone, right? Okay, so that's still going to be your sympathetic nervous system, but I would say running away from someone is not typically an aggressive act, right? That's kind of a, a flee. So when you're fleeing, then that, that, you know, we don't typically think about that. All that is kind of defensive, but we'll, it's not really defensive in the same way as like putting up your hands or something. But norepinephrine is what we call permissive, right? And what do we mean if something is permissive? It gives permission, right? So it allows that to happen. So, so norepinephrine allows aggressive behavior, but doesn't necessarily cause aggressive behavior. Okay. So we have to have norepinephrine present, to sort of have it, and that makes sense. How many of you have ever been aggressive, but your heart rate didn't go up? It's really hard to think about, right? It doesn't really happen that way. Boy, I was really just you know fighting that alligator. <laughs> My heart rate was just going down. Uh, I mean, that can happen like at the end if it eats you, but up until then, your heart rate's probably going to be pretty high, right? So that's cool. So it doesn't directly influence aggression? It doesn't directly initiate, but it allows it to happen, right? So it's kind of like a door. If I open the door, that permits you to leave. It doesn't force you to leave, right? If I open the door and I yell fire, me yelling fire is, is, is sort of what was driving you out, right? So can you be, you can't be aggressive without that? Absolutely. But just because you have it doesn't mean you're aggressive, yeah. right? Okay. So it's still needed for aggression? Yes. Okay. But it is not sufficient. It is not the driver, right? Just because you have high levels of norepinephrine does not mean you are aggressive. It just means you have the permit to be aggressive, right? How many of you have ever um, decided to organize a demonstration and you went to get a permit for that? Nobody? We should think about it. Everybody should know how to get a permit. Um, so that permit does not necessarily you know, organize your anti-pigeon aggression march. Uh, Got to watch those aggressive pigeons. But it gives you the permission to do that, right? There's like other things that have to happen for you to do that. I'm just waiting on someone to make a t-shirt about aggressive pigeons. Right now I really want to make a disparaging comment about a local business, but I feel like I should because I, I feel like that would be like really negatively impacting something. Um, and I, I just, I hate to squash local business, but I'm really fr still frustrated three years later about something. You haven't held a grudge, would you? No, never. <laughs> never have I held a grudge. Um, but you're still frustrated. Still frustrated yeah. three years later. Yeah. I'm still frustrated with that, that bookstore at the mall, too. Yeah, I don't shop there anymore. They would, they would, so my wife bought me some Christmas gifts there, in, including, which is not terribly pertinent, well, I guess it is, including a magnet that said Grumpasaur, which she thought was hilarious. Uh, but the, the shirt she bought me didn't fit. And so I went to go take it back and get a different size, right? Because it was like too small. I know, it was, they would not let me do an exchange without a receipt. It's like, Brie, what is that about? It's like, it's got your like tag on it. Just give me a bigger size. Right? Just scan it and scan it, and here's my name. I'll show you my driver's license. That's how these things work. Exchanges. I'm not asking for my money back. Well, I had the receipt at home. And so I went home and came back the next day and just returned everything she bought me for Christmas from that particular store because I could. Um, and then they asked me why, and I said, well, do you really want to know? You should have given me my shirt. That was two years ago. I still haven't bought anything from there. <laughs> the other the other place is brand yourself you guys know about that store like down there yeah I don't shop there because I was supposed to get a sweatshirt once that had the Huntington blizzard on it which I thought was going to be an awesome sweatshirt it's going to be purple with the big blizzard logo so for those of you from this area who remember the blizzard it was like that three weeks there was a hockey team in town uh, <laughs> Brooke you remember that 
Yeah, I was, I was I, like at that inaugural game. That was kind of fun. Um, and so it was going to be a cool sweatshirt. I didn't pay for it. But they told me it was going to be ready like three weeks. Never got a, I mean, never get anybody to call me. Didn't know what was going on. So no sweatshirt. So don't trust it. They'll take an order. Get a sweatshirt. I was excited about that sweatshirt too. So nor up in that for permissive. They'll let you be aggressive, but not make you be aggressive. Okay. Hey, who loves dopamine? That's kind of fun, right? Um, what will dopamine do for you? That'll make you feel pretty good. Most of the time, you don't think about like feeling good when you're aggressive, right? You typically think about things that make you aggressive are usually bad things, right? Except like that time you were a crayfish. Do you remember that being being a crayfish, Katie? And remember that time you were like aggressive and it helped you win a mate? That seems like sort of reinforcing, right? Okay. So if you're aggressive and you win and then you get whatever that is, like that really great parking space. I don't know if you, have you, anybody ever tried to aggressively park um, and like scare someone away? Or you're at the store and there's like <clears throat> that last bunch of bananas that's not rotten yet and you try to like stare down the old lady who's headed toward the, the bananas. Like, Those are mine. When you just run because she's old. <laughs> Sometimes they're closer. You can throw oranges though. Um, this is why I only shop at like 2 in the morning. Because uh, nobody's there. I mean, the people that are there are sometimes a little, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I may be in that group because I'm there at, like, at that time shopping. And then what happens is I go, I, I go in and I buy far more than, they, than most people who shop at 2 in the morning. Because I'm actually doing my real grocery shopping at 2 in the morning and not the like, I'm just going to buy beer kind of thing, right? <laughs> um, and so I have like a cart full, which is, you know, like $300 or something, right? right? A cart full of groceries is like $300, right? And then you go through and they only have the self-checkout lanes open. Yeah, but the lady who's there knows me now and she just opens up a lane for me and scans my stuff at Kroger. <laughs> She's like, we'll just take over here. She tried once letting me go through and it didn't work. So I was like, anyway. It was frustrating. Uh, because that schedule reinforcement was supposed to be the price of the item was supposed to add to my tally, my toll, and it did. So I scanned, it didn't happen. Scan didn't happen. And then it kept telling me to move stuff out of the bagging area. That was a problem. Dopamine is reinforcing. If you win an aggressive bout, guess what? Dopamine levels go up. If dopamine levels go up, guess what you're going to try to do again? Win another one, right? Okay, so if you are a winner, you're going to keep winning, and if you're a loser, I'm sorry, you're going to keep losing. So don't be a loser, that's, that's great advice. It's a real pep talk there. Anybody a fan of The Natural? Everybody seen that movie, The Natural? One of my losing is a disease. It, it, it's, it's a great film, and that's a great scene, actually. And then Robert Redford gets frustrated, and he leaves because he couldn't evict this guest speaker. All right, Brooke, this is going to be reinforcing things that um, are aggressive actions that end up being successful for you. They end up getting you access to the resource, right, or protecting your resource. They're going to, that is going to cause dopamine to be active in that sort of reward circuit, which is going to help you to want to be aggressive again, right? So it's reinforcing. So there you go. Questions about dopamine? That's awesome. All right, how many of you have heard of glutamate? Yeah, or glutamic acid, right? Kind of similar. Glutamate is known, I'm going to just draw a line over here, I'm going to try to write out a word. 
<laughs> it's the excitatory neurotransmitter, right? Okay, glutamate will cause positive ions flow into your nerve cells, your neurons, and they will cause you to have action potentials. That's pretty awesome. You can imagine, though, uh, maybe extra glutamate, sort of causing extra activity. But that's in the right brain circuits. It's in those brain circuits that cause you to perform aggressive actions then that's going to increase your aggressive behaviors, right? Anybody know a disorder, uh, a neurological disorder with excessive glutamate levels? I'm going to write it out right here. Yeah, seizure disorder, right? Seizure disorders. Um, it used to be called uh, epilepsy, right? But we, we, we kind of don't use that term anymore. We talk about seizure disorders. Um, I think because when people think about epilepsy, they think about convulsions, right? Yeah, you got you got you got to kind of work work, work your way around. Um, so seizure disorders, folks who have seizures have sort of funky glutamate function, right? They have excessive glutamate in particular brain regions, and that causes excessive activity. Uh, really, a seizure is simply um, unintended and uncontrolled neural activity, right? Most of the time when we think about a seizure, we think about a convulsion. Uh, a lot of seizures don't involve convulsions. Uh, seizures only involve convulsions if the motor cortex is involved, right? Any other part of your brain, which is really most of the rest of it, not going to cause a convulsion, right? But if it's in motor cortex, you'll have a convulsion. Um, if it's in other places, you, you can sometimes have uh, sensory hallucinations, right? If you have, um, for example, if you have a visual cortex seizure, you might start hallucinating random things. Right? You can hear things if it's an auditory cortex. Uh, you can have seizures in other places. Uh, typically not good, right? Because these seizures can cause self death. Uh, of your, your neurons, which can then, of course, cause you some serious complications and even death, right? So that's, that's not good. And convulsions are particularly bad because of the uh, extra risk of bodily harm, right? So, Brad, you're wondering, why am I telling you about glutamate? Uh, there is actually evidence that individuals with seizure disorders have increased aggressive behavior. And if you're controlling for everything else, right, Katie, then the, the difference in that case is going to be glutamate. So they have higher glutamate levels, so they're going to have higher, um, slightly higher aggressive. Is that when they're not medicated for it? Yeah, the medication is going to help uh, for that, and they, they may even sometimes need something to deal specifically with people. Sometimes you will also see uh, aggressive behavior in other geriatric or uh, psychiatric patients, right? And, and that can be related to, so if you think about individuals with uh, schizophrenia, for example, they have altered uh, dopamine levels, right? They have increased dopamine levels. Uh, and if dopamine is going to be reinforcing, it's going to be kind of reinforcing whatever you do if you have to do something aggressive, then there you go. Um, and then old people are just crabby. No, uh, they also don't shop at Kroger at 2 in the morning. They'll be there at 5 in the morning, but not 2. Uh, and, and so you don't have to like listen to the same guy you've seen three weeks in a row say, I've never used my pen to check out at Kroger. <laughs> and you know he has for at least the last three weeks, if not the last like three years, they've had the chip. Which is really frustrating. So glutamate, is that like the, the top one? Is it, does it allow aggression or is it an initiator of aggression? 
in the right circuits, it can actually initiate. Because in the right circuits, it's going to activate cells, and it's going to activate neurons in the, in, in the right circuits again. Um, if they're in other circuits, then, then maybe not. But if it's in the right places, it can actually initiate aggressive behavior. Because it is strictly excitatory on those cells. Hey, don't answer this question. Who loves alcohol? That got some heads up. Uh, I said don't answer it, but did he bring beer to class? No, I'm not allowed to do that. Uh, at least not for you. Uh, no, I don't think I'm allowed to in general. I don't really know what the rules are about that. Does anybody know? I mean, I'm curious because like some campuses allow you to have alcoholic. Like, like we actually can't have alcoholic beverages on campus. Uh, there, are, there are events I don't think you get invited to. There are events that I sometimes get invited to where they will have wine or beer or other things. Um, for right, okay. uh, Dean's like, yeah, sign up for all those that you can. Um, mostly, they be did have like a masquerade ball type thing on campus, I think. And, like, yeah, the idea had an open wine bar or something. I think I read a flyer about it, yeah, yeah, that's one of those things that in particular. Uh, but what about the like on campus in the dorms? Anybody live in the dorms? Can yeah, you, no. can't. you can't, no. oh, really. Well, if you don't get caught, you can do whatever you want. And, no, and listen, I work in dorms. Please stop trying. It's not funny. It's easy to tell. <laughs> yeah, it sort of is, right? Because when people like walk in, their backpacks are really heavy, and you hear the metal cans rattling. It's sort of obvious. Uh, you guys just got to plan ahead. Uh, I was just curious what the campus policy was. I didn't know. Uh, so they, part of that, I think, is related to the fact that the vast majority of college students are underage, right? Because you start college typically when you're 18 and you finish when you're 22, only a small percentage of that time is 21 and above. So in general, college students should be drinking. Like if you're just gonna like take a random guess, like 75% of the time you're underage. So on average, right? If you're a traditional student, right, Brad? That's that's math. Uh, so how many of you love GABA? And that's not Yo GABA GABA. I'm sure you all watched that like three weeks ago. <laughs> I don't have children. I, I have a ten-year-old nephew, so I do recall when he watched that show. I recall when there was not Jack Black on that show, and then I remember that time I saw Jack Black on there, and I thought, "Please, somebody give this guy a real movie because he's hard up for a paycheck." Um, they have special guests like that all the time. Oh, so I, I've seen it like twice. Yeah. And once it was Jack Black, and once it wasn't. Yeah, they have like Tony Hawk on there, like just like. Other people that yeah. need paychecks. Other people that need paychecks. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. Although Jack Black's one of these guys, I think even if he had like all the money in the world, he would still do stupid things. I think that's like the equivalent to being on the commercials. Like after you've had a big movie, like how people go to commercials, like yeah. you know, the guy might be the equivalent of that. Well, there you go. So that really in no way relates to this, but... <laughs> GABA is gamma amino butyric acid. It is actually, uh, guess what it is? I'm going to draw this line. And so you'll be able to follow this, and so you'll know which line goes where. <laughs> so you won't get confused. <laughs> yeah, it's inhibitory. Right? It's going to open chloride channels. And chloride is a Cl minus. That's not a grade you want, a Cl minus. Okay. So it's going to open chloride channels. And that's going to take cells and go, turn off. Don't fire an action potential. Don't be active. Okay. Now, as you would imagine, turning off cells typically would make you not aggressive, right? Okay. If I'm going to turn off cells, and we'll shut down some brain regions, you're probably not going to be aggressive. However, and that happens. However, there are times when you can give someone a GABA agonist, which is going to increase GABA function, right, because it's going to help GABA do its thing, and they actually become more aggressive. Okay? And one of the number one sort of things that increases aggressive behavior that you can I'm going to assume most of you, because this being an upper division class, I'm going to assume that more of you are closer to that 25% of the time in college when you can legally purchase alcohol, <laughs> um, is alcohol, right? How many of you have ever heard, this is a story you've never heard before, that like 
domestic violence is highly correlated with alcohol use. I know this is like a brand new story, right, Brad? Nobody has ever said that before. Right. No, that's pretty obvious, right? Okay. Uh, and I think we all know that. So alcohol is actually uh, a substance that, that, you know, people consume on a regular basis that actually increases aggressive behavior, right? It's correlated with domestic violence, violent crime, uh, you name it. If it's aggressive, alcohol is probably associated with that. Alcohol, though, is actually a GABA agonist, right? So you would think, well, like, why in the world if this is a GABA agonist, something that should be shutting down brain circuits, which it will eventually do, um, why is it making people more aggressive? And that's because you have to think in reverse sometimes, and you have to think about it, you have to think about inhibiting inhibitors, right? And so if you inhibit an in, in inhibitor, it's like a double negative, okay? How many of you love double negatives? Don't raise your hand because oh, that's wrong. Uh, nobody should ever say, I. What, what, what would be? I can't even. I, d I don't not love double negative. <laughs> I don't not love double negatives. Oh, jeez. <laughs> That's confusing. Uh, that's okay. I don't not love. I think that's that's not really a double negative. Like a double negative is more like. I don't not 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 love double negatives. Yeah. Like that. I feel like that was something new. <laughs> I'm trying to. So I have to be very careful because I don't want to like. I don't have none, right? I don't have none is a double negative, right? I don't have none, okay? And I think we've all heard someone say, I don't have none. Yeah, that's right? just common talk around here. That's just yeah, so that's, that's, that's why, Brad, I wanted to be careful how I said it, because I didn't want people to think I was making fun of anybody, because I'm not, right? And so had I said that in a certain way, Lauren, that would have come across as very condescending, right? Yeah. I didn't mean for it that way. I hope I, hope I handled that appropriately. And if I didn't, I don't really care. Um, and that, that actually works with the cost. Um, so that's a double negative. So GABA can sort of be a double negative, right? Because it can inhibit the inhibitor, the inhibitor, right? So if it inhibits an inhibitor, then guess what? Woohoo! It's exciting, right? So if you remove the brakes, right? So what if I were to inhibit the function of your brake pedal in your car? And this is in reference to what? So there are many circuits in your brain that are excitatory, and if we activate those, then we're going to get behaviors. There are other circuits that are sort of on top of that that are going to inhibit particular behaviors, right? And if we inhibit those sort of fail-safe circuits, then that no longer tells the other circuits, hey, don't do that. So if you think about being aggressive, right? It, it's really a smart thing to have an inhibitory circuit on aggressive behavior, right, Lily? Because if you're going to be aggressive, there's going to be a cost to that. And you have to calculate that cost. It actually requires a little bit of thought, right? We have to plan. Like, what's the likelihood that I can win this aggressive encounter, okay? And you don't want to just constantly, like, jump into aggressive encounters. Who remembers those monkeys who are constantly doing aggressive things? We remembered them in peace because they died, okay? Uh, right? Because they were constantly trying to be aggressive. Now, that was not the smartest thing they've ever done. But, Kate, if, if we can in, inhibit those behaviors, uh, then we've got this extra sort of layer of control, right? So it's not just can I turn it on, but I can also turn it off, right? So I can go either way. And we have to be careful. Yeah, you're going to ask about can glutamate excite inhibitors, right? And they can. not We don't see that as much. Well, just let me see if I'm clear. Okay, so. In short, alcohol stops you from stopping yourself from being aggressive. Yes. Right. That's, that's really what it comes down to. It's like the same way we would give stimulants to somebody with ADHD then, right? In a way, because when you give someone a stimulant for ADHD, it's to activate part of their brain that's not working, right? Acti to activate the inhibitors. Yeah, absolutely. Because you're activating that frontal cortex, which tells you, hey, stupid, don't do that. Right? So that's, that is why you give stimulants to someone with ADHD. Um, sometimes people will tell you you give them stimulants so that it will tire them out. It doesn't really work that way. Uh, it's to wake up the other part of their brain that's not doing anything. Right? The, the inhibitory sort of like 
I should really think about the negative consequences of this behavior uh, because people who have ADHD are, I don't know if you know this, they're impulsive uh, and they will often do things without thinking about it. Anybody know someone with uh, like an attention deficit, hyperactivity kind of issue? Yeah, they're often in the middle of something before they know they got there, right? And they're like, wow, how did I get here? Said, Keep going. So, yeah, turning on uh, that. So alcohol kind of works in the opposite by turning off something that should be telling you don't do that, right? Or, or at least put the brakes on for a moment. You can always turn off those inhibitors sort of, you know, with your own processes. So alcohol kind of has odd effects, right? Some people who take GABA agonists will always sort of be inhibited. Some people who take them will, will always sort of be excited. Um, at the moment, it's sort of an open field of investigation, right? At the moment, it's sort of, Elena, we don't really know a whole lot about the structure of GABA, right? And how that interacts with different GABA receptors and different um, subtypes of those receptors. And so there are folks looking at this, and, and as soon as they figure that out, we'll have a better story. But right now, it's sort of like, well, it's like on those medications, right? Like sometimes, like really, like sometimes when you take those like nighttime cold medicines, like sometimes it will make certain people a little extra hyper, right? Is that ever happened? And then sometimes it makes you sleepy, right? So that's kind of where we are on it right now. Like, well, just give it a try and see what happens. Most of this is going to be on what we call sort of the ascending arm of the dose response curve. So like at the lower sort of dose, right? If you give somebody enough alcohol, then they're clearly going to be inhibited. So you're going to fall asleep. This is what you think it is. It's really called blacking out, which is a, a different process, but you can roll into sleep, right? And then always rolls into like, like sand in your eyes, right? I don't know. Uh, but on this ascending arm of that dose response curve is sort of where you will see this differential activation or differential outcome with GABA agonists. Okay. Once you sort of get up a little higher at the higher doses of GABA agonists, I mean, at that point, we're really pretty much universally going to be inhibitory responses. But leading up to that, you can get the excited, to, you know, the increased aggression on occasion. Xanax, that's a GABA agonist, right? <laughs> what was that face you just made, Brad? It was this face. <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't really see somebody on Xanax fighting people, though. Like, yeah, but so... They steal in stores and stuff because they don't have the... They sort of don't have any frontal cortex telling them, like, hey, don't do that. Right. Um, which that's why they're not mean. They just, like, take stuff. <laughs> yeah. You can be aggressive and not mean. It's still resource acquisition, though, right? If you really think about the strictest sense of why are we aggressive. Uh, you can even see this sometimes with benzodiazepines, uh, which is another thing you wouldn't think about. Somebody on benzodiazepines like, wow, really just getting after somebody. Uh, because most of the time when you're on benzodiazepines, you have to have people like drag you off the floor, right? Uh, they're pretty, pretty hefty. But lower doses can, can cause some aggression. You've got to titrate your doses, right? Or just give them a while. Questions about that? If uh, if a neuron has a chloride channel, does that mean it's inhibitory? All neurons will have chloride channels. Okay. Yeah. So they'll all have now they won't all necessarily have dopamine receptors, but they'll all have chloride channels. They'll all have sodium channels, because that's how we adjust things up and down. So GAB is probably going to work on just about, uh, GAB is going to work on a lot of cells. But in particular, it's going to work on, um, well, yeah, it's going to work on just about every cell. You have interneurons who are typically inhibitory, and they'll open fluoride channels uh, on other cells to kind of turn them off. That's a good question. Other questions? I've only got one more slide, which is going to take me another hour to get through. Because I like these slides, right? They're really informative. <clears throat> I made these 15 minutes before class. That's a little bit of a lie. I was working on them five minutes before class. 
All right, so questions, alcohol, glutamate, GABA, pretty good story. Again, these are not necessarily, I mean, these are not conflicting with serotonin, right? The serotonin story is still there. This is sort of riding on top of that, right? So this is kind of another layer to it. All right, see, look at this, the last slide. Uh, who loves nitric oxide? Hey, hold on, we're also going to talk about Siberian hamsters. That's going to be fun. No, you don't like Siberian hamsters? I don't like the gas. I don't like the gas. You don't like the gas, nitric oxide? When I go to the dentist, I just like, don't like taking That's nitrous oxide. Oh, okay. Slightly different. You don't like that either. So this is nit nitric oxide. It's NO. What you get at the dentist, big difference. Huge difference. Yeah. <laughs> There's a two. Aren't they both gases? They are both gases. Nitric oxide, though, will not make your dentist um, seem like your friend. Nitrous oxide will. Yeah. It's to some people. Although once my dentist tried giving me nitrous oxide, it didn't work. Surprising. That's why I don't like it. It doesn't work on me. Yeah, they just tried to use it for a long time. And then I was like, it's also like eight, and I pitched a real fit, so I had to get a filling. I was like, get this. Uh, and then I had to go back later. My dad's like, all right, you're going home. And I don't remember that being pleasant. Uh, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure he was upset about that. Uh, and then we had to go back. And then the next time I was like, can you just not like, what I really hated was the lidocaine shot in my jaw, which I thought was really painful. Right, and so since I've been eight, um, the only time I've been anesthetized for dental work was when I had my wisdom teeth yanked out. But any other kind of like this drill, it's like just let them drill, it's, it's fine. Thankfully, I brush my teeth, so I don't have to worry about that too often. Every time I go to the dentist, just since I moved here, my dentist always says, "Your teeth look great. I think we'll keep you." And I, and I, that's, that's a weird, I'm thinking, what you should say is, your insurance looks great, I think we'll keep you. Your teeth look bad, we're definitely going to keep you. Uh, because, you don't, I mean, I mean, she doesn't make any money off me, right? I go in twice a year, they, they actually use this baking soda spray, right? Does anybody go to a dentist where they, they like sandblast my teeth? Uh, which I like that better than the, that brush, that thing would always tickle my nose, like the, the, just go up my nose, right, when they use that little polishing brush, like the toothpaste fume. I don't know, I didn't really care about that. Nitric oxide, we've known about this for 100 years, right? Um, it was kind of profound. Uh, so we've known about this for about 100 years, Brooke, give or take figured out that it actually has some benefit for like cardiovascular health, right? Um, anybody heard of nitroglycerin? Yeah, they give that to people that have heart problems, right? Uh, nitric oxide is sort of a byproduct of that product. They didn't really know that that was a byproduct for a long time. They're like, why is this? Uh, back in the 1990s, nitric oxide was named like molecule of the year, like in probably like 92 or something. Uh, also in the 90s, uh, the guy who did a lot of work on nitric oxide function and uses uh, in your body. He got a Nobel Prize for that. So that's pretty cool, right? Nitric oxide is uh, the byproduct of the conversion of L-arginine to L-citrulline. These are just amino acids. How many bodybuilders do we have in the class? That's what I thought. Uh, I mean, please don't take offense to that. If you were like, I actually am a bodybuilder. Um, and for some reason, I, I didn't pick up on that. Just keep working. Uh, you'll get there eventually. The point on this is, uh, how many of you are familiar, or how many of you ever looked at, like, um, athletic supplements, weightlifting supplements? Is this fitness? like pre-workout? Yeah, uh, pre-workout. They'll stick nitric oxide in there. Uh, they'll put arginine. Anybody uh, seen arginine pills? The idea is that that's a precursor to nitric oxide, and so you'll make more nitric oxide. Why would you want more nitric oxide if you were like working out? Remember that time I told you about the cardiovascular health? 
Nitric oxide is actually a vasodilator, uh, which means it makes your blood vessels bigger. Okay, so it's going to increase blood flow. And if you're like going for the world's largest biceps, you definitely want to have blood flow going to your biceps, right? So you're whatever. Um, there are other things that you might want to increase blood flow to um, at various times in your life, right? Yeah. I'm not going to call you out on getting that joke first, but uh, <laughs> rest of you just wait. Uh, but uh, so, for example, Viagra uh, actually is uh, will increase nitric oxide as well. So that's kind of a major component there. So nitric oxide, it's a gas. It does a lot of cool things. There are actually sort of three sources of nitric oxide in your body. There is uh, sort of this induced immune-related nitric oxide. There's nitric oxide that comes from your endothelial cells, which are in your vascular system. And the third source, which is what we're going to talk mostly about, comes from your brain. Okay. So we've got this byproduct of this process. Nitric oxide comes off. What's awesome about nitric oxide? It is a gas. We've already established that. It's also super small. Okay. This allows it to be a great signaling molecule in your brain. And the reason for this, Abigail, is who's heard of the phospholipid bilayer? Okay, it's a bilayer of phospholipids. And I know that really cleared everything up, right? Brandon's like, wow, I understand the phospholipid bilayer now. I'm just really glad you phrased it that way. Your cells are made of, their outer part is the phospholipid bilayer, right? And you got the hydrophobic and the hydrophilic parts, right? You don't have to worry about that too much. Most things will not readily come into your cells. The only things that get into your cells uh, are things, one, if there's a door, like an ion channel, right? There's like a whole door there. The reason we need ion channels is ions are charged, right? They have a positive or a negative charge. Anything with a charge cannot get through the phospholipid bilayer. So things that are uncharged, they can kind of slide in. Also, things that are small. If something is really big, it's not going to get in, right? Because you're not going to be able to wiggle in between the, um, the phospholipids that are making up that cell membrane. So nitric oxide is awesome. It's a gas. It's small. It doesn't have a charge. It can get in and it can get out of cells. This is why Chelsea is such a great signaling molecule, right? Because I don't need a channel for it. I can send it back from one cell to the other. It can go everywhere. If you've got a lot of nitric oxide, then you can go, OK, awesome. Now, how many of you have ever tried to measure molecules of a gas? You can just count them, right? You, one, two, three. Doesn't work that way. Okay? And because it doesn't work that way, we have to rely upon sort of an indirect method. Cindy, do you remember that time that we talked about measuring the metabolite of serotonin and not serotonin itself? That was kind of an awesome experience, right? We talked about. We have to do something similar here. We shouldn't measure arginine levels. That's not going to tell you how much nitric oxide you have, right? That might tell you the potential for nitric oxide. What you could measure is citrulline levels, right? So you can measure cells that are positive for citrulline, and then you can maybe have some idea about how much nitric oxide you're creating. Okay? So that's how we're going to measure a lot of this. So that's pretty exciting, right? So we can measure these. Uh, sort of by this sort of next step, right? That process. And then we can assume we know sort of how much nitric oxide is there. All right, what else do you need to know about nitric oxide before we move forward? 
Yes, we did. How many of you love knockouts? I don't mean like the Mike Tyson guy. Is Mike Tyson still, he's still a relevant cultural figure, right? Not, not maybe for the same reasons that, that he used to be, right? Like 30 years ago, he was relevant for a different reason. Now, I don't know, how many of you realize Mike Tyson used to be a boxer? That's, that's, okay, so not everybody, though. Um, he's not just sort of an idiot running around with a, a lot of problems. <laughs> Sleep at that. Uh, he used to actually do something. Now, maybe what he, he did for a living created those problems, right? Get, getting hit in the head repeatedly is not great for your future. So that's just toss that out there. Okay, in case you were thinking, you know what I'd like to be is hammer tester, and I'm going to use my head as the testing chart. Not the best thing to do. When we're talking about these kind of knockouts, we're actually talking about a genetic process, where it's typically with mice, because the, the mouse genome has been sequenced and we can screw around with it and make it do things that we want it to do. All right, so we're going to make a knockout for producing what's called NOS, or nitric oxide synthase, which is what you need to produce, here's a real surprise, nitric oxide, right? Synth Synthesize, make, so it's going to be synthesized, right? We can uh, genetically engineer mice to lack the genes that create nitric oxide synthase, but not just nitric oxide synthase in general, any of the three types of nitric oxide to synthase, right? Remember when I said, hey, there are three kinds of nitric oxide, they come from three different places, we can knock out any of those particular types of nitric oxide synthase. And that's going to be helpful, right? Because maybe it's maybe it's nitric oxide in general, but maybe it's just nitric oxide from one location, right? That can have an effect on your uh, behavior. So what I'm about to tell you is a series of confusing and conflicting stories. Because I've never done that before. So I just wanted to give you a warning that that's what was going to happen. Right, Bree? Are you okay over there? No. Where's Will? I know. Yeah, he should be here. <laughs> I know. He would it's love this sad. class. It is sad. He could subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'll, yeah. I'll let him know. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he'll do that. He might. He's, he's he like would. the one person who I think might do that. He would. I think he would. <laughs> Hey, what's in NOS? What's the N stand for, you think? Nevada. Uh, uh, neuron, nervous. Sometimes you'll see this as BNOS. Uh, that's brain nitric oxide synthase, but in, in your text they refer to it as NOS. Neuron nitric oxide, that's fine, whatever. Uh, if we knock out neuronally derived nitric oxide synthase, then we're not making nitric oxide in our brains anymore. Okay? What's kind of interesting here is, guess what that does? It makes male mice more aggressive. It's not really a surprise, right? So the removal of that does? Yeah. You, you actually want nitric oxide for a lot of reasons. Okay? Um, not related to, uh, you know, cardiovascular function necessarily. So but the lack thereof is what leads to that. Absolutely. In male mice, that's important. Write that down. Because females who are in NOS knockouts, uh, guess what? Don't, don't, don't really see any change in their aggressive behavior. So that's kind of strange, right? What do you think about that, Kate? You thought that was intriguing. And if you look at the next line down, I say like interactions with testosterone, right? Okay, so maybe, maybe we're telling a complicated story here, right? Maybe it's not just nitric oxide, but maybe it's nitric oxide and testosterone. And we're gonna have like a whole unit on testosterone and other hormones, right? So we're just giving you a little preview story here. 
Uh, in these knockout mice, the male mice who have been castrated, uh, that does not seem to cause an increase in aggressive behavior. Okay? So, no testosterone, no nitric oxide, no aggression. You have to have the testosterone and the absence of nitric oxide derived from your brain to increase aggressive behavior. That would explain why the females who, here's the real, like, I know nobody knows this one, Meredith. Females don't have as much testosterone as males. They have some, but not as much, right? So that would explain why the female in NOS knockouts, right, Katie, aren't aggressive. Because it's that interaction with testosterone that's allowing that to happen. Again, nitric oxide is needed for normal brain functions, right? Okay? And if you run out of it, your brain's not going to be doing normal things, okay? and your brain is not going to be working at full capacity. And if simultaneously that your brain's not working at full capacity, and guess what, then you've got a lot of testosterone, you might try to attack another mouse, because that seems like a bright idea, when in fact, it probably wasn't. Okay? There's a lady, she's going to check the page. It's page 261. I don't, I don't know, I just guessed. I don't even know how many pages are in the book. I got my money back for the book. Did I tell you guys that? So you got, if you're missing a book, you can go buy it now. The bookstore has it. The one copy I returned. So, that's in NOS. We talked about interactions with testosterone. They, if we then do like a hormonal replacement therapy in these castrated male mice, their aggression level, if they're an in NOS knockout, will go back up to what we would see, um, you know, in just an in NOS knockout male mouse. All right, so that's the brain nitric oxide. What about that nitric oxide that's coming from your, uh, your vascular system, your endothelial cells, right? We call it ENOS, endothelial derived <coughs> nitric oxide synthesis. Does that have an influence on your behavior? And here's what's actually really interesting about this. If you have an ENOS knockout mouse, guess what? The males are actually docile. So in this case, we, we've done the same thing. We've knocked out a source of nitric oxide, but it's had the opposite effect on behavior. It's pretty weird, right? Who would have anticipated that? Probably nobody. That's why well, you studies. said endothelial mm -hmm. um, was the one from the. It's from like your blood, your your yeah. your vascular system, the endothelial cells of your blood vessels. Could that then mean that they don't have like a physical feeling of getting aggressive and like the? You said it was a vasodilator, so maybe they just don't feel aggressive, maybe? If I made any sense. <coughs> I'm thinking. Okay. This is my thinking face. Don't shrink yourself too hard. I usually don't. I usually just give an answer and then hope it's right. <laughs> In this case, I, I thought I'd actually try. It's going to be new. I think, Lily, what, what's interesting here is uh, most of the time when you're aggressive, you actually, uh, what's really interesting about this, in general, when you're aggressive, you, you will dilate some of your blood vessels, but you'll also constrict some of your blood vessels, right? And so it's kind of interesting. When you are being attacked or you are attacking, you're going to shut off uh, blood supply to like non-important things, like your digestive tract, right? Because it doesn't really matter what you're doing with that hamburger you just ate if a lion is getting ready to eat you, right? What does matter is what you do with your arms and your legs. And so you're going to increase blood flow to those regions, right? Uh, and decrease blood flow to other places. So that makes some sense, right? And nitric oxide being a vasodilator 
would, um, interestingly, you know, a spike in that in some locations would be indicative of, um, you would think, right, would be indicative of increased blood flow, which might be, you might think, well, like if I'm increasing blood flow to my arms and legs, then I'm probably under attack or am attacking someone, right, or something. But I don't know. Feel's not a word I use. Well, I just know that, like, with anxiety, sometimes people think that they're having anxiety and have anxious behaviors if they have, like, a racing heartbeat and stuff, but it might not actually be anxiety, but they think that's what it is. So I was wondering if it could kind of be a related thing. Jeez. Oh, William James. Uh, can I say that? I, I said that sort of as a curse, right? I, I, I didn't mean it. <laughs> I didn't mean it that way. Uh, so... so there's like, I didn't really mean to get into like the whole like theory of emotions, right? But I think that's actually sort of pertinent to this discussion. Uh, and William James had this idea. You guys know William James? Okay, that's his name, right? William James? What's his brother's name? Henry James. You guys know Henry James? I mean, not personally, but just, in, I mean, because these guys have been dead for 150 years. I'm assuming none of you met them. So William James was like the father of psychology. You guys all thought it was like Sigmund Freud, right? That guy came to the show late. <laughs> he came late and brought his mom as a date. Uh, <laughs> which was awkward on more than one count. Um, William James, on the other hand, uh, he actually wrote a book called, like, Psychology, right? So that kind of tells you, like, he was an important. It was like back in the other, his brother wrote um, Portrait of a Lady. What is the name of Anybody know that book? What do you guys do with your time? Sleep, <laughs> study, Netflix. Two of those three answers were correct. <laughs> One of those was not. And because I don't monitor your viewing or sleeping habits, I'm going to tell you it was the studying. I do know how much you study like indirectly by measuring, uh, not arginine levels, I don't measure how much time you're spending in the library studying. I can measure the L-citrulline levels. I can tell how much time you've been studying by your exam grades. See? There you go. Spend less time sleeping, you know that. Anyway, William James, his idea about emotions is uh, basically what you just said. Like, if for some reason I accelerate my heart rate, uh, then, you know, if I make myself behave as though I'm nervous, then I'm going to actually feel nervous, right, whatever that means. Uh, it's the same thing with, like, you guys know about the pencils in your mouth? Who knows about pencils in their mouths, right? Uh, this is like an awkward story. Um, all right, everybody put a pencil in your mouth. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, so you can sort of like, like, you know, like, right, Brooke, you know what I'm talking about. You can like hold a pencil with your lip, and if you do it one way, you're like smiling, and then you're like gonna feel happy. If you do it the other way, you're kind of like scowling, and you're gonna be angry. Um, and so if you walk around, like, so you know, I want everybody to do this. For the rest of the week, walk around like this. See if it like makes you more angry. And if so, then William James was right about something. I mean, I mean and if not, then he probably wasn't. Um, his argument is that sometimes, uh, Behaviors perceive feeling. Behaviors perceive emotions, and sometimes emotions perceive behavior. You know, whatever. Um, so there you go. I think that's what you're asking. Um, I don't really know how, because I don't know like how closely you're able to actually monitor your nitric oxide levels, right? Uh, I mean, you do monitor, of course, these levels, right? Because you have chemoreceptors in your um, in your vascular system. You also have uh, like stretch receptors for blood vessel size, right? That are going to tell you if your blood vessel. You're not going to be able to know like, wow, that blood vessel in my arm is constricted now. Uh, but your like brain will know, and they'll, they'll kind of monitor that. Like the parts of your brain you're not in control of, right? I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows. But you can try this. You can get a bunch of mice, and you can ask them if they feel aggressive or not. Um, if they're you know knockouts. All right, Nina. Why does it matter if it's synthesized in the brain yeah. or in the heart? It's a gas. I don't know. Okay. No, that's a good question, actually. 
Uh, it, no, it really is. It, it actually really is. And that is the question, really, right? It's the same product. It's a molecule, it's an atom of nitrogen, and it's an atom of oxygen. Now, it's, I don't know, you think it's going to the same places? It can move just as freely, in and out. But it has a differential effect on behavior. Yeah. So, so I don't know. So maybe I'm doing the fact that the brain is low. That there is a lot of correlation with the brain and aggression, like, I mean, and, and behavior in general. Like your brain is what controls behavior, so they're for neurotransmitters for the neuron. You would think so, but you would still think that the nitric oxide is going to, again, because it just freely floats wherever, like, like you would assume it would still get there. Right? I don't know. I, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. I don't know that anybody knows. I think there's still people working on this. So it'll be exciting to find out. You guys can do this study, though, and get a bunch of mice, but only ones that don't have nitric oxide synthase, and breed them together and see what happens. But nobody's going to do that. Um, but we should talk about a couple other things. So we talked about interactions with testosterone. We talked about males versus females. <coughs> Who loves hamsters? Okay. Anybody else? We got like two people. I have a couple I need to give for give away. No, I don't. Uh, so, how many of you know about Siberian hamsters? Okay. Wow. You really do love hamsters. So, so Siberian hamsters um, are kind of odd, and they're kind of odd in their behavior patterns because who remembers that time I said. Uh, and if I haven't said it, just listen this time. That during breeding season, right, when you're trying to mate, because um, mates are a resource, you, you might increase aggressive behavior, right, to try to obtain or retain uh, access to a mate, right, and to mating opportunities. That seems reasonable, right? So most species you would imagine during the breeding season would, would kind of get a little more aggressive, right? We see this, who remembers that great story about those red deer that just like at each other 3,000 times a day? <laughs> right, Elena, you remember that story, right? Somebody's gonna watch this video and they're gonna say like, what was the word he said there that was bleeped out? <laughs> and that word was I don't know, it's too offensive for YouTube. Uh, I don't know, is anything too offensive for YouTube? What are they gonna do? I don't know. Where you find out? I should know this. So, Elena, they had those deer and they were just like yelling at each other 3,000 times a day. They, they didn't, I mean, like if there wasn't like a female deer around, there's really no point to that, right? And then they're just gonna like go over to the deer bar and, and have a pint of Guinness and, and, and everybody's gonna be friends. This is what they do, actually, I know this. Uh, in case you've never seen a, a deer at a bar, they always order Guinness. Um, especially red deer. The, the, the white-tailed deer, or more into IPAs, but I don't know why. Just, just thinking about that. Um, so, Brett, mating season typically increases aggressive behavior, except in these Siberian hamsters. They actually get aggressive in non-mating season, like more than they are during mating season. Uh, how many of you have ever lived in Siberia? No one. No one, right? I actually uh, went to graduate school with a guy from Siberia, which is kind of interesting. Uh, he was convinced that the reason McDonald's was successful is because Mr. McDonald, which I don't know if you know doesn't exist, uh, Mr. McDonald invented a um, machine that can fill up 12 cups of Coke at one time. And that's, that's what made McDonald's so successful. He could fill up 12 cups of Coke at once. I, I don't know if you've ever seen the back of a McDonald's. There's not a machine back there that fills up 12 cups of Coke at a time. Um, and Mr. McDonald is definitely not operating it. So uh, the veracity of Russian documentaries is suspect. Because this was like a whole, it's a 12 part series he told me called America. And apparently there was a whole part devoted. This is a true story. I'm not making, I wish I was making this up. This is a true story. There was a whole episode like an hour-long episode devoted 
to McDonald's and its magical 12 cup of Coke machine. <laughs> This is why we need freedom of the press, folks. Um, so you don't go somewhere else and embarrass yourself. Because I told him, that's ridiculous. I said, I actually briefly worked at a McDonald's um, a few decades ago. And we did not at that time have a machine that would fill up 12 cups of Coke. And Mr. McDonald's name was actually Ray Kroc. So just as a heads up, you know. Actually, there was some McDonald's brothers, but they didn't last long. Brad's going to say no. No McDonald at all. It was that old McDonald had a farm. It's Ronald. They've done away with him, right? It's a sad day for clowns. You ever wonder about that? Like, like, what about these people who made their living as a clown? And then there's like a few crazy clowns out there, and then they lose like their whole livelihood. I just think that's really sad. Nobody else really thought about that, did they? You were just like, keep those crazy clowns off the roads. <laughs> but they're like legitimate clowns, mm -hmm. and they're out of work too. And you see like protesting with a sign and like a woman that was. Oh my god. That gets into a whole other thing. It does. Like red noses, that's over the line. Uh, so, Siberian answers. <laughs> Siberia, in case you guys don't know, it's kind of up at the top. So there's like, we live on a planet that's round. I know, that's a shocker for some people. And at the top of that, right, there's like this like cold part. I mean, it's still cold for at least a few more weeks. Uh, so there's that cold part at the top, the relatively cold part. It's getting smaller. Uh, and Siberia is up there. The other thing about that, how many of you guys know about the sun? So it's like that big glowing thing you see most days. Hang in there, Lauren. <laughs> Sometimes the planet is, you know, this is actually important. Because I know some people don't know how this works, right? So the planet is not like oriented straight up and down, right, Kate? Okay, it's, it's got a lean to it, right? So like one leg is longer than the other, and so it walks with a lean. And that lean rotates over time, right? Because it kind of spins around. And sometimes, like part of the top is, like the top is sometimes pointed toward the sun. So it kind of stays like exposed all the time. And sometimes it's pointed away, and it doesn't really get much sun at all, right? And so for those of us who live relatively in the middle, and we're relatively in the middle here, right? Um, I know most of you think like you're not as close to the equator as, as in reality that you are. But if you were to measure your like, how long is it daylight to how long is it not daylight sort of thing, it comes out about even, right? Give or take a little, OK? If you're at the top or at the bottom, if you were to measure like how much is daylight and how much is dark, it's not even at all. It's always skewed to one way or the other, right? So it's skewed really far. That can really screw up your sort of activities, right? So if you think about this, um, I did this really great science experiment once where I had bean sprouts and I tried to grow them in my refrigerator. Yeah, didn't work. Um, because apparently plants need a few things, and one of those is sunlight. Okay? And if you are like a hamster, uh, and like the rest of us, we actually depend on plants for our food, right? Even those of you who think, like, I've never eaten a vegetable in my life, and I believe it or not, I know there are some of you out there. Uh, you eat things that eat vegetables, right? Okay. And so you need vegetables in that growing season. If you are, like, Kroger doesn't really have a growing season, right? I can always go into Kroger and get food. But let's imagine Kroger didn't exist and I had to, like, procure my own food. Then, the, and if I lived near the top or the bottom of the planet, the time of the year when I was like close to the sun, there would be more things for me to eat, right? But the time when I was like not close, you know, I was like tilted away from the sun, there'd be fewer things for me to eat. So guess when I would probably be more aggressive? At time. Yeah, when I'm tilted away, right? So, so, so when you're leaning away from the sun, because the day length is going to be different. If you're a Siberian hamster, you have evolved in that environment, right? You've evolved in the environment where half the year you get a lot of sun and half the year you don't. And so that has to affect your behavior. I know, Brad, has, he, he's just now writing something. He was waiting. It's like that 10 minute story to come back around to make a note. But it was coming around, right? And so I had to set everybody else up for this. So 
when you've got the daylight, you don't really have to be that aggressive, right? Because you're like, wow, there are things for me to eat all the time. That might also be a good time for you to breed. When you have like extra food available, believe it or not, like breeding, like cause, you need some calories for that, right? That's, that's like a physical activity. Um, and if you're on the end of that breeding interaction where you could potentially like start growing other hamsters inside of you, you're definitely going to need a lot of extra nutrients, right? So you're going you're gonna to have that. If you're in that shorter sort of day phase, um, you're not going to be probably breeding as much, but you are going to be really trying to acquire uh, resources, right? And resources are going to be scarce during that time of year, so your aggression is going to increase. So that's kind of an interesting, atypical sort of story there with hamsters. Yeah, so the effects of uh, nitric oxide are not going to be the same on Siberian hamsters because they have that atypical response. So you're not going to see the same sort of typical increase in aggression if, they're, uh, if, you're, if you're giving them a drug that's going to block because uh, we don't have necessarily like Siberian hamster knockouts. If you give them a drug that's going to block um, INDOS, for example, you're not going to see that same sort of shift in aggressive behavior. Unless, you know, it's going to be more related to that long day, short day. Okay, that's going to be the overriding thing. So very contextual, right? It's kind of a cool story, actually. So, Brad, what kind of hamsters do you have? I had a Siberian. You had a Siberian. Did you, now, did you store it in a long day or short day? Just regular day? Yeah. I was just hanging out. Just hanging out. <laughs> you should have left the lights on longer. It would have made it more docile. It was really sweet. It was nice. What was its name? Can you share that? I don't remember. Okay. I was like four. Oh. <laughs> there you go. That's something. Um, so we talked about Siberian hamsters. We should talk about Down syndrome as well. How many of you are familiar with Down syndrome? Also known as tri trisomy 21, right? So this is known as trisomy 21. Uh, this is uh, more common with uh, slightly older mothers, right? Because, um, think about how I want to frame this story a little bit. If you're a female, and like when you're born, guess how many eggs you have? And the correct answer is like all that you're ever gonna have, right? Okay, so you don't make new ones. If you're a male, guess how many sperm you have? Well, doesn't really matter. You're gonna make some more in about three seconds, so. You just get a fresh new pile of sperm all the time. Uh, sounds a little odd, but that's how it works. <laughs> uh, if you've got eggs, then that's all you get, right? You, you're probably going to shoot out a few hundred eggs over the course of your lifetime, one from each ovary every other, like every other month, right? Every month you're shooting out a, an egg, but you're going to you know, alternate which one's firing. Uh, occasionally, they'll both fire at the same time, and that's how you get twins. Some kinds of twins. The other way to get them is to like accidentally split them in half early um, if you just get one. There's no real way to make that happen. You can't just like start massaging your ovary to try to get it to wake up if you're trying to have twins. Nobody thinks about these things, right? Uh, so what was this whole story about ovaries for? <laughs> Down, syndrome. Down syndrome, yeah. <laughs> Forgot where I was. Um, because you've had these same eggs for your whole life, and like let's imagine you're like 40, 40-year-old um, eggs are not, um, they've been hanging around a while, right? And so the likelihood is a little more complicated on the female side than it is the male side. Because the female side, there's like, more DNA there than you need, so you're going to have to chuck off half that DNA, right? Because you don't want three sets of every chromosome, you just want two. But you've already got two on the female side, but you need the sperm, right? To make, you know, so you're going to like get rid of some of that. Sometimes that doesn't happen properly. And that 21st chromosome, one of those pairs doesn't get thrown away, right? So then you end up with two from the mother and one from the father. It's called trisomy 21, okay? Not a big deal um, in terms of understanding this, right? So that's how Down syndrome works. Why did I tell you that complicated story? Because we want to recreate this in um, other species. 
right? So that can be tricky to do um, because other species don't have the same number of chromosomes that we do, okay? So you're not going to just go like, well, this one gets, what if it doesn't have 21 chromosomes at least? Then you can't give it three because who knows what you're doing then. Um, also, right? <laughs> and even if it has more than 21, they're, they're not exactly organized in the same way, right? And so for mice, what they found is there's like a stretch on some of the chromosome, on one of the chromosomes where they found like that's the same stretch of genes that we see on that 21st chromosome in humans. So we don't have to replicate the whole gene if we want to sort of create Down syndrome in a mouse. We can just replicate that short sequence of one of their gene, uh, one of their chromosomes, and tack that on, and then we've essentially created trisomy 21 in a, in a mouse. So why is that important? Because this is going to be a little bit of a mouse story. Well, I just, I thought cats got Down syndrome. Can get Down syndrome. Huh. Yeah. I guess they could have just used cats then. Yeah. <laughs> Why are they trying to recreate it? Hang in there. Just for studies and research. Yeah, I, I mean, in general, because you want to understand, like, how Down syndrome works, yeah. there are some, um, there are, there are a number of sort of adverse effects of Down syndrome, some of that's related to cardiovascular health, uh, other, uh, you know, sort of developmental health concerns, uh, and if there are ways to, another thing is uh, life expectancy of individuals with Down syndrome is less than individuals who don't have Down syndrome. And so thinking about ways to, ways that Down syndrome works, and then you can think about ways to sort of alleviate some of those effects and maybe even ways to prevent uh, Down syndrome altogether. Is there so something off about the nitro oxide thing? That's why it's on this slide bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're getting there. But I, but I thought I needed to set up Down syndrome part. And then you asked about the cats, which really threw me off. Um, I don't know how many chromosomes cats have. I'm assuming it's a situation where it's not their 21st chromosome, but it's whatever is homologous to that, yeah. which is what, what we say when something's like similar. Uh, one thing that you see in individuals with Down syndrome is you actually see uh, sometimes increased aggressiveness, like, like, like that can happen. Um, and typically when that's going on, it's because there's also this sort of correlated alteration in their nitric oxide uh, function. So if we can create a mouse that has sort of Down syndrome for the mouse, then we can study uh, a lot of things, including nitric oxide uh, function in that species. Kind of an interesting story. So does the chroma, like the extra chromosome have the effect on the nitric oxide function? Or I'm not certain is it just that, that we really know yet. Um, it would be exciting, right, to see if, if that includes, um, you know, if that's directly affecting um, NOS levels or if it's, uh, you know, some sort of promoter that it's affecting that, that could be the case as well. How about those Siberian hamsters? Do you want to see the pictures of them? Huh. Well, that's something. <laughs> there you go. All right, any other questions? That's sort of the content I had for the day. Uh, if the male becomes those sizes with E and O S, uh, does that mean that the females become more aggressive? That doesn't seem to be. That doesn't seem to be. Uh, and I think that's because of, again, testosterone being, I, I, I think in this story, nitric oxide and the other things that we talked about today should be viewed as more modulators, right? And again, kind of in that same way as norepinephrine is being permissive, maybe. Maybe something else has to be there. I think in this case, testosterone is going to be sort of an overriding story. Um, kind of odd I didn't present you the testosterone story first. And good question. In individuals with Down syndrome, um, the nitric oxide is it the lack of Down syndrome? Or like in the mice, how it's the lack of nitric Yeah, it's going to be, you're going to see a similar or sort of sort of movement of nitric oxide levels as you would in the mice with the folks with Down syndrome.
But wait, so...